Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Elsevier South Africa team, I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone to this year's Library Connect. We would have really hoped that we would be meeting in person for this experience, but we are really glad that you could join us online. My name is Dinesh Srimudli. I'm the customer consultant for Elsevier. Joining me today are my colleagues, John Sturley, who is the account manager for Elsevier, Lucia Skumbi, who is the senior customer consultant for research intelligence, Dion Lubber, who is the solution sales manager for research intelligence, as well as Mohammed Sayed, who is responsible for marketing. Just a few notes before we begin. Please do use the question and answer box if you have any questions throughout the session. The Q&A will be addressed in the last 15 minutes of today's session. We are going to endeavor to answer as many questions as possible. However, we will only have 15 minutes available, so we'll try to do as many as we can. We will be having three sessions today with a 15 minute interval between sessions. You will be using the same Zoom link for the entire day, so you can decide whether you'd like to remain logged on and take your breaks, or you could disconnect and reconnect using the same link. The recording of today's presentation, as well as the presentation slides, will be available on the platform which you use to register for today's sessions. They will be available tomorrow for a period of three days, and you can download them from the platform. We also encourage you, if you can, to please visit the Exhibition Center on the website and uh, really get a feel of if you were at the Library Connect. Um, at these exhibition stands, you can get valuable product information about the Elsevier portfolio. We always thought that we did a fairly um, good job. We saw ourselves as, as heroes when it came to assisting students with their um, their studies and their, their research um, endeavors as throughout the academic um, academic year. So suddenly, um, end of end of March, beginning of April, we were stuck with COVID nineteen. The library was closed. Everyone was working in isolation. The the library campus. Everyone moved away off campus, working remotely. So where previously most of our students. Uh, on campus, whether it's in the library or at the um, uh, faculty computer laboratory, now everyone's away. And uh, we had to accommodate this, um, this new environment and how would we um, treat the, the students to um, uh, training and, um, and learning in, the, the, in a new manner. So we were suddenly confronted with um, Teams and as we are using today, Zoom. So it took us completely out of our comfort zones as, as librarians. Um, we love our comfort zones. We create comfort zones to feel space, to feel safe. Um, so we had to move away from our comfort zone and to, to move into an, in, um, an online environment. But before we could even actually start in presenting these online classes or, or training or, or webinars, there were a few things or a few challenges that had to be um, addressed. Um, and now some of these challenges weren't in complete, we were, the library was not in, in control of these, um, of these challenges. Uh, for instance, our clients would have now moved away from campus. How was the internet access? Um, and I, I'm mentioning our clients now, but this is also true for staff members as librarians. How, how was your internet access um, from home? And um, in relation to that as well, obviously if you've got internet access, you need data. You cannot have uh, limited data when trying to access um, information to support your research. But I must say here that the uh, the university management had the foresight to um, address these issues and identify um, these internet access and data problem or not problems challenges as potential issues that they had to address. So they identified um, students who had um, a lack of data or a lack of internet access, and through various um, excursions, they um, addressed the situation. For instance. The, um, in collaboration with various service providers, the university management 
got the uh, the university website to become zero rated, which was fantastic and brilliant. And um, actually, the library website was um, eventually included as a zero rated website, and we thought that was all just brilliant and fantastic. Um, but we didn't read the fine print, which said that even though the library website was zero rated, the information on the databases that you access through the library website wasn't zero rated. So you still needed data for that. So if you needed to access a, uh, an Elsevier a database, uh, Science Direct or Scopus, you still need a data and internet access um, to do that. And obviously another challenge was uh, fairly basic. Um, our students really needed state-of-the-art um, devices and laptops. And again, here the management, uh, university management, had the foresight at least to identify students that, that needed that. Um, because beforehand, you know, the library was a safe place. The building was a safe place, conducive to, to research and studying. So had we supplied students with, with PCs that they can come and work in. But now, obviously, everyone's moved away from campus and um, they couldn't make, make use of the library or the other faculty computer laboratories um, anymore. And eventually, when these issues got addressed, we could move on to the actual training of, of our clients. And um, as the, the lockdown progressed through the, the various stages and we started with these training sessions, uh, we eventually found ourselves to be fairly comfortable with the, um, with the training. And then suddenly we were confronted with another challenge. And this is um, as the, uh, the famous Simon and Garfunkel song goes, um, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend. Um, this is intentional, this black screen. For those of you who are not familiar with South African conditions, our local or national electricity provider, every once in a while, they run into fewer power shortages, and then they implement load shedding throughout South Africa and the different regions. So we also had to accommodate these load shedding um, incidents or episodes during our training. And I'll address some of the solutions or suggestions how we um, actually navigated our way um, around this. The next um, challenge that was faced was mainly um, by our clients. And if you can remember, as I mentioned earlier on, um, the client services division in the, in the library, including the branches, we are very focused on, on our clients and we try to assist as, as, as best we can. And that's why we always thought that we, we are heroes in our client service um, environment. But because everyone has now moved away from the library and everyone is now in unfamiliar territory, um, not sure how to um, maybe um, gain access to, to databases. And as I'm looking actually through my um, three bullet points here, maybe the third bullet point should have been right at the top. And um, I should have added um, lack of in between client and knowledge, because suddenly the, the students couldn't come to the library and ask for, for assistance um, uh, to the librarian. They now were on their own, or so they thought they were on their own from wherever that might have been in South Africa or even internationally, because um, at Stellenbosch University we also have um, international students. And we received a lot of emails throughout lockdown from our clients having difficulties in accessing um, databases for their research. And we never, as librarians in the client services division, forgot about the mission that we were busy with trying to um, get to or solve successfully. And that is trying to get the, uh, the 2020 academic year completed successfully. So that was how we are trying to support our clients as well um, in our way with those um, key performance um, areas that I mentioned earlier on. So we had to make a decision. How do we assist these clients? Remembering also taking into consideration that some of these clients might have internet access issues data um, limitations. So to a fair extent, we started over servicing and, uh, and over assisting maybe um, some of our clients, which at the time was, I think, what was you know, called for. So if a client had 
access issues to a journal article or maybe from a law perspective a, a piece of legislation or a court case we downloaded it for them sent it to them when they needed it and also we discovered that during lockdown clients were really very anxious about accessing information and it was usually at a point of need where they needed this information and we tried to support them as best we can as quick as possible because sometimes they had a, an assignment due the, the day after the next or they had to write an exam so we really try to assist our clients with providing them with enough information um, as possible um, trying to um, navigate the database problems that they might have um, had from accessing it um, from off campus never mind all the the, the training that um, they are provided with um, so relating to this particular challenge was the next one um, and that is how we provided our clients with um, assistance where they were off campus or working remotely now at Stellenbosch University at the, at the library we were always very I'm proud of the fact that we um, have access to a wide variety of databases um, that support uh, clients in their research. And this is just an example on the screen in front of you of some of the databases that we do have access to. Um, and um, we continuously review our subscriptions every year because we have to adjust our research. You know, research changes over the years. And for instance, this year, suddenly COVID-19 research became a priority. So we review our subscriptions on an annual basis to see where can we amend a subscription or where do we need to delete one or add a subscription, taking it into account budgetary uh, constraints. And this year was no different, um, especially because suddenly we were confronted about with this whole movement going from print to online um, sources, not necessarily the databases, but I'm referring here to books. Now I'm from the law faculty, or responsible for the law faculties, and uh, they are still very much, um, they still very much use printed books. Um, I can say the same with some of our other faculties like theology, our arts and social sciences still heavily or heavily rely on um, um, printed books. And I think probably they look to the heavens um, during the, uh, <laughs> the COVID-19 um, lockdown and how do we now sudden how do they suddenly now get get access to these books because um, from some of our undergraduate students needed complete books for their assignments or for their for their exams and we can't just make the whole book available as part of our our e-reserves and again here for a library to subscribe or to buy or to purchase um, electronic books we had limited options um, first of all obviously it's, it's it's expensive for a library to buy an, an online book and whether you purchase it outright whether you lease it or subscribe to it it just costs more than whether you're an individual that would buy an online book and sometimes we didn't even have access to the online book especially to our um, prescribed textbooks um, and handbooks and um, where previously we would buy electronic books but mainly uh, to supplement um, the printed books or even uh, when a printed book wasn't available we buy the online book but still you know you would download a chapter or two and then re read the the printed version um, maybe a bit um, later on but once we started purchasing um, electronic books for our clients we had to make a, a mind shift regarding the reading of, of e-books, um, librarians as well, because now there were print uh, publisher uh, limitations placed on how much you, you can download. So the mind shift concerned about, you know, having to actually read the book online. You can't just print the book or some chapters uh, to refer to later on. The upshot about this though, was that our clients actually became aware of copyright restrictions and where why there are copyright restrictions where previously i think they were a bit um, lacking in their um, in their whole idea of what copyright um, restrictions meant 
Um, so moving from the 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 on or the printer to the online version takes me straight to the um, the the library building as as a space, and um, our clients would usually come to the library obviously to to borrow um, the printed book or just to to visit the library as a study space um, or to do research. And this picture that you see in front of you, I think, was taken again here when our first years came for, for orientation. But this picture could also, or the photo could have been taken during exam times when we usually have students queuing out before the library would open um, in the mornings to get to their particular um, favourite spot um, in the library. But now suddenly, um, during COVID-19, the lockdown, the students couldn't visit the, the library building um, and um, consult with, with uh, the librarians anymore, um, which was an issue because working from home, we received numerous emails from clients that had to access material that were only available in print, um, which we couldn't assist them with. Um, so that was a huge challenge for us, and I'm going to jump straight into a few suggestions and how we uh, addressed this this um, this challenge or breached barriers and overcame obstacles as as a superheroes normally would. Um, from the the 15th or the middle of May, when we moved from what was it, level five to level four um, lockdown, a few of us, I think there were five of us that were allowed back to the library for a couple of hours, one day a week. And here we develop superhero strength and speed, carrying books to the printers um, and carrying books to our clients who needed these books and copying chapters or um, a journal article that was only available in print, obviously taking into account um, copyright restrictions, rules and regulations, always do that. Um, and we only had a couple of hours per day to do that. And um, I hope that our clients um, really appreciate the efforts that we did here, because obviously that the clients couldn't come into the library. We had to email them beforehand to tell them, listen, we are going into the library today and at this particular time, please meet me outside and we'll have your, um, your parcel of books um, available for you um, to borrow. And so that was a, a, a solution that we came up with uh, to address this uh, particular challenge. And eventually when the lockdown four moved to lockdown three and um, the university invited, um, I think it was about a third of our students back to campus, um, the library also obviously thought about how can we accommodate students now back to the physical um, the building. And we um, had a working group that looked at this, this particular issue, because not only do we, can we open the library, or we're thinking of opening the library to our clients, but we had to adhere to the strict um, COVID-19 lockdown regulations and protocols to make sure that our clients, as well as the staff, um, that were allowed back um, on campus during lockdown three were, were safe or felt safe and that the library building was, was still a safe place to come um, and study and, and do research and also be uh, sanitized, um, which is another word that, I, uh, that we use quite often uh, during, um, during lockdown. And um, we, we went to, to this process very thoroughly, I think. Um, there were various divisions involved in the, this whole process and how we decided how we will reopen the library, not just the client services um, division. Um, and we identified a few areas within the library that we felt safe, that our clients would also feel safe um, when they do visit the library. And we made sure that, that our clients had to book online before they came to the library. And uh, when they actually um, um, arrived at the entrance, they had to show proof that they actually um, uh, did make a booking on their, on their cell phones and also had to provide proof that they, um, their health check was just perfect and they um, are healthy and uh, can be um, can be visiting uh, the library. And um, I have to compliment our um, circulation staff here because they were usually the, um, the staff members that had to make sure that the, the client that's visiting the library in this awkward circumstances felt safe and, and comfortable. 
um, to, to visit the library and our circulation staff did a fantastic job there. I think everyone felt um, comfortable and safe and they were shown which areas they were allowed um, to study in or to do research in and they, they weren't allowed to move obviously and uh, browse amongst the shelves and um, have consultations with, with librarians. Um, the only concession that we made was bathroom breaks. Bathroom breaks were fine, but apart from that, please stay in the, the cubicle that was designated uh, to you. And um, the, the uptake at the start was a bit slow, sluggish. I think a, a few students were still a bit apprehensive to, to visit the library um, uh, during the, um, the, the, the start of the, the lockdown three. But as the, um, the weeks progressed and uh, we then moved to, um, to lockdown, where we now one, and we actually opened up a few additional spaces for students. So now we actually have um, up to uh, 100 students that can visit the library. And I just want to quickly move forward to the, uh, the library website. And you can see there in the center of the screen and then that little gray bar. Um, from the 12th of October, actually, we now have up to 100 students that can visit uh, the library with the same very strict um, COVID-19 uh, lockdown regulations and protocols that has to be um, adhered to. They still need to make their bookings online and prove that they have done their, their health check um, before entering um, the library. And we've seen a progressively uptake in the, um, the, the, the um, the occupancy rates of these areas, where it's now some of the, the areas are actually now occupied more than 90%. So it's really proved to be popular and it's shown us that the, the library building itself um, is really a very safe space for our students. It's conducive for, for, for study and for research purposes. It might be unique to Stellenbosch University Library, but I'm pretty sure it, it must be universal. Um, to other students, um, for other students um, as uh, other universities as well. Um, so that was the the challenges and how we met these challenges. Some of the solutions and suggestion, or, you know, suggestions for um, how we opened the uh, the library for our clients. Now solutions regarding the the online instruction. Now, I remember I did mention the, the internet access and the data issues and the hardened software issues that's beyond the control of the library. But before you can even start with an online training session, um, you need to have this in place. Um, whoever is responsible, just make sure that they have that in place because that's really the foundation of a successful um, online training session. Without that, um, you're going to struggle. Are really going to struggle but luckily as I mentioned um, the university um, did um, have the foresight uh, to sort that out and to address those challenges. Um, what is more in control in the control of the librarian are the two last bullet points um, the buddy librarian and the uh, lecturer assistants and we did find that if you um, offer a, an online training session or a webinar, whatever the case might be, get the lecturer to send out the invite. Um, it just gets so much more buy-in from the, from the clients. And what you can add, add to, the, to the lecturer invite is actually just a one or a two-liner where um, you can explain to the, the clients why it is important to, uh, to attend these, um, these webinars or this online training session. And then the lecturer will, will send it out. It's almost as if uh, the lecturer is taking ownership of your, your training session, but, but not really. And that seemed to really address the issue of um, clients not pitching up for, uh, for training sessions. The, the buddy librarian um, is also quite important um, to have an online training session or to present an online training session on your own can be a very daunting task. Um, I'm thinking of my arts and social sciences and uh, economic and management sciences librarians who have 
masses of students that they have to train. Um, and sometimes in a training session, they would have, I guess, 100 and more students uh, attending an, an online training session. Um, luckily for me at law, um, we don't have that many students, although I do have my, my colleague Sibu, who assists me with, with training sessions. And it's just so much easier to have a buddy or a colleague to assist you with the training session to take over the technical side of the whole um, meeting, the Teams meeting or the Teams training session or the Zoom training session, where your buddy can sort out all the, um, uh, the technical issues. For instance, the logging in, um, clients logging in late. Um, you don't want to be dis disruptive to the people who pitched up. Um, online, you want everyone to have a, a favourable experience during the uh, uh, the training session, and also the, your buddy can sort out any issues as the training progresses. If there are any questions or problems or challenges that uh, arises during your your training session, your colleague or your buddy librarian um, can sort that out, or maybe just allude or uh, make you uh, tentative to a problem that the um, your, your uh, your audience might have. So taking into perspective, these five bullet points are really need to be addressed with them um, to have a successful online um, training session so that everyone can have a, um, uh, a favorable experience um, regarding training and uh, online training and teaching. Yes, the uh, solutions or suggestions regarding our um, accessing you know, information from off campus um, or remotely. Um, I think it was in 2017, it might have been 2018, we designed a library guide for our off campus students or clients. And at the time, obviously most of our clients were on campus. Um, but we did start to address some of the issues that our um, off campus clients uh, experienced. But as COVID-19, the lockdown started and basically all our clients suddenly became off-campus users and actually uh, staff members also became off-campus users, we had a relook at, the, um, at our library guide and we just um, fine-tuned uh, the, odd, the odd entry point. And I'm just going to show you an example of what our library guide looks like. It's, it's not a live link, but you can, I'm pretty sure, Google off-campus access for Stellenbosch registered users, and you'll get access to the, uh, the off-campus um, library guide. It's open to everyone. You can see what we've done with it. Um, we've addressed some of the major issues um, regarding off-campus access, you know, password problem issues, Google Scholar problems, oh, browser preferences. Um, and uh, for instance, the, the Google Scholar problems relates directly back to clients that were struggling to get access to uh, maybe to databases from off-campus and then they jumped immediately onto Google Scholar where they were confronted with additional issues with um, access, sign in, and you had to buy articles or whatever you were looking at. So we, we have a nice Google Scholar little guide on how you can change your, your preferences, your library preferences or settings uh, to make it just a bit easier to access um, information um, on, on Google Scholar remotely or, or off campus. And also what we started doing um, is the next point, um, our smart researcher workshops, which was designed actually before lockdown um, commenced. Um, these smart researcher workshops were designed specifically to address certain aspects of the whole research um, process. So it wasn't necessarily um, uh, meant for a specific module or curriculum bound, and it was also primarily and aimed at our graduate students, although we also designed a few where our undergraduate students could also attend these, these smart researcher workshops. But obviously during uh, COVID-19, this whole smart researcher workshops um, moved online and we presented um, webinars uh, as, as webinars. Um, and uh, just as an example, I'm gonna just show you a few of these um, webinars or workshops um, that was part or that is part of the uh, smart work smart researcher workshops 
For instance, the top one, um, which I see is actually new, uh, find trustworthy information on Google and Google Scholar. You can see it was presented on the 22nd and 23rd of uh, September over a two day period. Um, clients had signed up for this uh, particular workshop uh, could, could um, work on their own pace. But the brilliant thing about this workshop is that we had two dedicated librarians that were there to assist um, the clients that did sign up for this particular workshop. And I think here lies the difference between the library as a study space and supporting um, our clients in their research is that we always there to assist. You know, clients that work in a, in a normal computer laboratory just do not have the, uh, the assistance that they do have in the library. And I think that is why the library at Stellenbosch University, including all our fantastic branch li libraries, are so popular. It's the, the, the service that they, they get from, from us. And we've, we've sort of tried to transfer that online to our online training sessions um, as well. And on the next screen, you can see that uh, this is the next aspect of the whole um, research process, um, research data. And we've got my colleague Samuel, who's our research data manager, presenting uh, these, um, these courses. And you can see here, you started in February doing the, the, um, the workshops um, in the library, but progressing to the online workshops online. And I mean, Samuel is an absolute, Brilliant. What he doesn't know about research data is yet to be invented. So his workshops are always very well attended. Um, but we've also realized that as library uh, librarians, we don't know everything all the time. And we're not experts in everything. So in the anal analyze, collaborate, and create um, section um, of um, the research process. We've actually used experts from outside the library, from our innovation office, to present these courses. For instance, our copyright um, class was presented by um, a, a, not, a non librarian, uh, but an expert from our innovation office. So we've used other um, staff members um, to present some of these classes. The second entry there, our, our Mendeley course that we present throughout the year, what we've done there is in collaboration with the actual class that we do present, we have a library guide that's linked to this particular class so that students or clients afterwards can go back to the library guide and refer to the library guide um, to see or to assist them with any issues that they, they might have. And you can see there's a whole range of my colleagues that do assist with the, um, the, um, the training um, regarding um, Mendeley. Right, um, moving on to the, uh, the barriers that had to be breached by our clients um, regarding our online access um, sources. Our collection development strategies had to be um, amended during uh, COVID. COVID-19 lockdown. Um, we suddenly were confronted, as I mentioned earlier on, with by purchasing online books. And these books, as I mentioned earlier on, were quite expensive. And um, you know what library budgets are, especially for books, um, it's not that big. And um, so what we did, and I'm going to use the, the, the law, the from the law library side um, as an example because these electronic books were so expensive we needed our clients to to be aware of these sources um, and to use these sources because we needed um, some sort of return on investment here and we still needed our clients to also remember to successfully complete this 2020 um, academic year and we knew that our clients had access issues regarding the library website. Even if they could get to the library website, they didn't know where to find um, electronic books or databases and whatever the case might be. Well, they were struggling with that. So um, Sibo and myself, my colleague from law, um, we designed a, a little page on the law library guide that listed the undergraduate textbooks. And we started this little page, um, I think it was in the middle of May, might have been a bit earlier. 
um, as a page where the, the undergraduate students, and there are about, I think, 600 um, undergraduate law students at Stellenbosch. It's a, it's a fairly smallish um, faculty, but it was the one central paid space where they could go to and access their textbooks. Um, and it was very convenient um, for them. And luckily enough, the, the local League, um, legal publishers started making the, the undergraduate textbooks available to universities um, to buy and as the months progressed we added additional books and I think we have between 60 and 70 books now listed on this particular guide. It's marketed regularly. Um, um, Sibu does a fantastic job here. She um, markets um, the guide on, on social media so students are aware if a new book is added, they know about it. Um, and so far in the last few months, we've had um, nearly 3,000 hits by um, our students in accessing these, um, these online books. So it's really, um, it proved to be a nice solution to, to our students um, to access books. And I would suggest you market your, your, your e-books as well in that matter, because it, it costs so much money and you really need your, your clients um, to use it. The, the next barrier that our students were um, confronted with is, um, yes, it's the, um, the good old library website. Um, what can I say about the library website that hasn't been said before? And I think this is a, a universal issue <laughs> for, for, for libraries, is that uh, clients struggle to find information on, the, uh, on, on a library website. Um, and I guess it... it it is because of the, the complexity of the resources that clients um, have access to on, on, on a library website. We have, you know, we subscribe to very complex databases um, from the law side of one law database can have access to commentaries, court cases, legislation, journal articles, encyclopedias, books. Um, and it's just not so easy to find this by just going through um, uh, the library website. And I also think that our clients sometimes expect ready reference answers to, to questions. <laughs> that is just not deliverable um, when they are doing complex research. You know, Google and Wiki, Wikipedia, whatever other general search engine is, um, is used by our clients just won't answer those, those research, que research questions that they have. And I think they, they struggle with, with finding these um, answers to their research by you just using the, the library website. But it is something that we are addressing at the moment. We acknowledge the fact that uh, the website might not be that intuitive and we will try yet again to fix that. And again, I hope and I'm pretty sure that this is a, a universal issue for most libraries throughout the world. Uh, but I think it's an ongoing concern. You know, as, as you move, progress to an academic year, you get a new intake a new generation of, of clients with new expectations and the, the library website is, uh, revolves, it's a it has to evolve as your, your client's expectations uh, evolve. So the, the solution that we had, and, and I'm going to use the, the, the law library as an example here again, is that we don't use the library website at all. Um, and uh, before I get, sorry, I forgot about this particular slide. Um, before I get onto the library um, or to the law, the, the law uh, library guide, this is what our library website looks like. Well, it's just the, 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 the top half of the, the library website. And I really think this is easy. If a student or a client needs information, well, it's right in your face there. It's a nice search box. It's huge. It's big. It's very Google-esque in its size. You know, it says, search for books, articles, music, multimedia, etc. We've even put their little magnifying glass. And if you don't know what the magnifying glass is there for, hit the search button. But really, um, what, more do we, what more do they want? Well, in any case, we're going to find out. As I mentioned earlier on, we are redesigning. We're in the process of redesigning uh, the website. But that's what it um, currently uh, um, looks like. Right. So as I mentioned earlier on, um, from... An, the, the law library perspective, we don't really use the, the library website um, that much. Um, we use our library guide as a, um, um, as a foundation from where students can find legal information. Um, so you can see there is myself and a 
and I actually need to update that photo. That's from many moons ago. But there's my colleague Sibu as well. Sibu can't join us today. She's writing her LLM or LLB exams today. So good luck, Sibu. I'm pretty sure you'll do all right. Between the two of us, we um, have redesigned the, um, um, the library guide um, to assist students, especially during lockdown, um, to find information and relevant information when they need it. Um, we've always thought that it's, it's very important to, the, to have the, the right information at the right time to the right clients. And we, we believe that the, the, the library guide um, is, a, is a tool that you can use. Um, so between 2014 and 2019, uh, we've had this this guide running um, and it's proven to be quite successful the the law faculty is only about 900 students i think it's it's, it's a fairly small faculty um, but every year since 2014 up until 2019 we've had between 32 and 33000 hits per year which i think is pretty impressive um, but during COVID-19 lockdown, we've changed a few of the pages. For instance, we have added the South African online textbooks. We've changed a few of the specific law resources, uh, the pages for that, for instance, constitutional law, our intellectual property law page, refugee law, which is brand new, and the Roman law pages to address um, issues that, that students might have um, when working off campus, not having access to, to the physical library. And what we've discovered is it's become actually even more popular. Uh, this guide, um, as of today, has had nearly 42,000 um, hits, which is 10,000 more than, than is usually the case. And we still have two months to go. So um, I think we've been successful in using our lib guide as a tool during um, COVID-19 to address some of the issues that our, our students um, might have with um, finding um, information. And the next challenge that we need to address or that I think can assist students or our clients when accessing online sources from off campus or remotely is a, ch a chat functionality. Now, we've discovered that our clients during COVID-19 can be very anxious and apprehensive about information. They really do need assistance at the point of need or just in time. Um, sending an email just isn't you know, good enough. They need feedback right now. Remember, the library is closed to a lot of them still. They can't come to the library and get their, um, their assistance um, straight up. So this is something that we um, are looking at currently. Um, it's not been implemented yet. We have a few logistical issues uh, to sort out, um, but the challenge I'm pretty sure will be met. So what my colleagues and I have done in the meantime, oops, I need to go back one. Um, and I'm just showing you the, the, um, the library guide for law. And this is what my colleagues, um, the faculty librarian colleagues have done on our library guides is we've added an online appointment appointment link as well so you now have options to contact us whether it's via email or you can make your own online appointment just to let them know that we are here and we are trying to support you we are trying to support you to uh, complete your, your 2020 academic year um, successfully um, so this is just another way of showing us, of showing our clients that we are there for them. You know, the library is supporting, supporting you with your, your research um, um, during 2020. And um, I think that is actually the, uh, the end of the presentation. Um, I see that I actually have a conclusion there, but I don't really have a conclusion. Um, I just want to acknowledge some of my colleagues um, in the library. You can see there is a photo of some of my colleagues working from home. We're actually back, back at work for those that uh, were allowed to return to campus. And you can see everyone is fairly chipper and happy. And I still believe if you have a happy librarian, you're going to have a happy a client and um, I think it was really important um, for us as a, as a library service that everyone in the library not just the client services now, I'm thinking about the, the our technical service division who don't necessarily um, um, have direct contact with our client services client services but our technical services division in their own way 
also supported the, um, the university's aim to have a successful academic 2020, um, uh, 2020 year. Um, and this is our IT section, our acquisition section, the metadata and cataloging division, all supported um, this particular mission and they, they supported the client services. Um, excellently. Um, as a, just as an example, our, our dean from law ordered a, a book a couple of weeks ago and she put the order in um, in the morning and just after lunch I sent her through the link so she could read the uh, the book online. And she was extremely impressed and I have to acknowledge the, um, the assistance that, that I received from our acquisitions and our cataloging department and our Quickly, they have adapted to um, have information available to our clients um, at the point of need during the um, challenging uh, times that we have had. And um, so I think that the whole library, the success that we've had, the superhero efforts that we've put in was a collaborative issue um, from all the divisions of the library and the branch libraries. Everyone worked together to get to this aim of hopefully successfully um, finishing up the 2020 um, year. And luckily our, our management had this um, fantastic mission of the, uh, of the library and how it was aligned with the, this vision that the university has for um, having a fantastic um, um, information service and being inclusive and innovative and um, just how the library aligned with that. So it just made it a bit easier for us to align ourselves with what the university wanted um, in their aim for, for 2020. So a huge thank to all, thanks to all my, my colleagues um, from all the, the different divisions. Um, yeah, and I think that's it. Um, Dhanashri, um, that's it from my side. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you for that presentation. I really liked the way you presented and uh, you kept us entertained with your jokes through the presentation as well. So thank you so much. Um, there were some questions. I think there was a hand raised and uh, I think we're already in the break. So I'm just going to take the one. Um, somebody had raised their hand. So I'm just going to get to it. It's Mishak and I, I'm going to unmute you. So if you have a question, please feel free to ask the speaker. Is Mishak there? Hello? Okay, maybe he had raised his hand in, in error. But um, on behalf of the team, we just want to say thank you for that presentation. And um, really, it was very insightful. I think from our side, we, we did have one question just to ask you your thoughts. Do you think that the challenges that the library faced will change the way the library works even when returning to normal conditions? Do you think that your students will continue to work um, the way you have now trained them to be familiar with an online environment? Well, that would be a, a, a best case scenario, but <laughs> I think uh, our clients as our clients need constant training as databases evolve and the content of databases evolve and just the whole idea of information and how research evolves and changes. I think that even though the clients might be more familiar with accessing information online, um, no, they, I think they would be, they would need um, continuous assistance. And I think they do appreciate the, the assistance because sometimes they really struggle um, to find information and we can assist them maybe just a bit better, not better, but uh, a bit quicker. Um, but some of the changes that I think that we will have to address is the whole issue of um, online books. And I did allude to this during the, the presentation on how um, a faculty like law, for instance, who rely heavily on printed books have now actually been converted to using online books. So I think there we will definitely um, move our collection development policy more to um, um, an online book environment. Um, in comparison where previously we would focus mainly um, on books. Um, yeah, I hope that addresses your question. 
Absolutely. So some light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> so thank you so much. And um, to everyone that's attending, we're going to break and return at 1415 jo Johannesburg time. So we'll see you in the next session. Thanks. Thank you.